one of my favorite things to do is to address this church and to preach. Um, I, I sometimes, when my wife and I are flying into New York City, I can't believe that we live here. Like when I just see the skyline of Manhattan, I'm like, yo, we really get to, to live and to be here. New York City truly is the greatest city on the planet. Now, one of the things that's amazing is, even though I live in the greatest city on the planet, sometimes I take it for granted. We have friends who visit us, and it's really in their eyes, in the awe in their eyes, that I get to rediscover the beauty of New York City. We took some friends with us to Maison Pickle on 85th and, and Broadway. They got this thing called honey butter pull-apart bread. It'll make you speak in tongues, it's so good. <laughs> Even the Presbyterians, y'all might mess around and break out. <laughs> and every time we go to like that restaurant and eat that amazing food or any of the other thousand restaurants in New York City with incredible food, I just kind of go home like it's normal. But it's really not. Every time my wife and I, we go to a Broadway show, every time I'm there, I'm just in awe of the brilliance and the beauty and the, the gift and the skill and the passion that I'm witnessing on stage, and I'm in awe. But then I leave and I go home and I'm like, oh yeah, I should go see another show. Since it's just a few subway stops from me, I'll go months, sometimes years without seeing one. And it's because I just kinda, I kinda take it for granted. People arrange their entire year around seeing one show on Broadway. They plan for vacation, they book flights, they arrange for kids and childcare, they fly across the globe just to come to something that I ride past on a subway every day without thinking about. Other times, it's not New York City that I take for granted, it's, it's the people in my life. The other day, my wife and I were having a conversation about just some good friends that we have. Now, friends are people who have chosen to love you, even though they are not obligated to love you. And if you have some good friends in your life, people who love you, people who will ride with you in the good and the bad, don't take them for granted. Sometimes I take the people like my friends for granted. Other times I take my kids for granted. You know, the other night I was walking into my boys' room while they were asleep, and I'm not really grateful for them when they're awake, but when they are asleep <laughs> and they're quiet and they're not doing anything, they're just laying there. <laughs> just for a, a moment, Sometimes it moves me to tears of the gratitude I have just for their sheer existence. And for a moment, I'm, I'm reminded that these two boys are a treasure. They're a gift to me. Now, it's not just New York City or the relationships or the people in my life. I also take God for granted. God has become something that for me, once upon a time, there were moments of just this transformative experience that I had where God consumed my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength. God consumed my conversations. I wouldn't go a long time without reading the scripture, but eventually God became normal. He became regular. God became something that I needed to fit into my day, I needed to do, but it was something that I took for granted. And oftentimes, God is something that I take for granted in my life. Now, I think to a certain extent, this is kind of normal. Uh, we all take things for granted, and taking things for granted is a kind of mental dullness that is applied to whatever we find ordinary. We will surely succumb to it again and again unless we fight hard against it. This is because when everything goes as expected, we, we run out of reasons to cherish what we have, and remain alert. Now, my hope for today is that we will become more alert and more aware of the gift, of the treasure that Jesus Christ is, and that that would be the fuel for our lives. Jesus tells a parable about the kingdom of heaven, and it's about treasure. And unlike the treasures that I mentioned that will be here one day and gone another, this is a real treasure that will last for eternity. It's about something that's right in front of you and something that should make us ecstatic, and yet we take it for granted. In Matthew 13, 44 through 46, Jesus says these words, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field that a man found and then he reburied it. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. Jesus' description about life with God is that it's something that if you were able to perceive what it is, you would gladly, in your joy, get rid of everything else in your life in pursuit of it. It would be something so precious to you like this fine pearl. It would be something so beautiful. The value of this would so outweigh everything else that to get rid of everything else wouldn't even feel like a sacrifice. It would feel like an upgrade. Now, for so much of my life, I've ignored this part of what it means to follow Jesus. Most of my life following Jesus has been about the duty and the obligation that I am called to as a Christian. And make no mistake about it, as a disciple of Christ, if you want to follow Jesus, there, is, there are obligations and, and duties and things to do. But for today, I want us to sit in the concept about what it would look like for God to be a treasure in your life. For you to rediscover the pearl, the precious jewel that Jesus is. For us to be motivated by a desire for God, not duty to God. Here's what Jesus says in Luke 9, 23. We'll be in the scripture for the next five weeks. It says, then he said to them all, this is Jesus speaking, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, full confession, I've actually preached this sermon before, uh, the scripture before, rather, and I have completely ignored the first part. I've talked all about what it means to deny yourself. Very vital. We'll get to that next week. I've talked all about what it means to take up your cross in obedience to Jesus. I've talked all about what it means to follow him, and I feel like I've neglected this first and most crucial part of what does it mean to desire to follow Jesus. What does it mean for you and I to desire him, to desire to follow him? Here's where we're going today. Jesus' first call to us is not duty, but delight. Jesus' first call to you is not to do something. It's to discover something. It's to discover him in a way that he would be a treasure for you. And in, such ha- in, in, in that happening, everything else in your life would fall into place. Jesus' first call to us is not duty. It's not obligation. It is delight. It is desire. It is him becoming more precious to you than everything else. You know, I've never met a person in which God was the most precious thing to them and their life was out of order. But I've met a thousand people with a a whole truckload of good intentions of guilt and shame on their back who have tried to do a better job and things never line up. Jesus' first call to you, Jesus' first call to me is not to duty, but it's to delight, it's to desire. So one of the things that we talked about before is the difference between Australian and American ranching. So in America, if you were to go to Kentucky or some of the bluegrass, you know, the hills, the rolling hills of Lexington, and you'll see all of these beautiful fences. If you were to go to, to Texas, you'll see all of these uh, big longhorn uh, cows behind these fences. But if you were to go to Australia and go to the outback, you won't see fences. Fences are not the thing that they use to keep animals close. What they do is they dig deep wells, trusting That if we dig a well deep enough, something life-giving enough, we don't have to fence these animals in because they will always be drawn to the center. Here's what Jesus is getting at in our life. Many of us have grown up in church traditions where they've had amazing fences. The fences that would electrocute you if you try to get out. (laughs) And we've never discovered the well at the center. And so we go on repeating the thing that has been modeled for us. We try to build other fences around other people. We try to build fences around our kids. We try to build fences in our church and our DNA groups. Jesus is calling us to desire, to delight, to find a well. Jesus is more Australian than he is American. (laughs) That's why I think them, them worship songs when they have Australian accents sound so good. So what does it mean to desire? To desire means to find pleasure in, to want, to wish. What if this characterized your life with Jesus, that you found deep pleasure in life with God? 
that you wanted God, that your wishes and your desires were for him. Now, when I think about the things I find pleasure in, the things that I intensely want, if I'm being honest, Jesus is not always number one on the list. Jesus is not always in the top 10 of that list, if I'm being perfectly honest. And um, I think that's a pretty normal thing for us. Uh, I think everybody kind of shares a certain foundation. Here's what Romans 3 and 11 says. Romans 3 and 11 says, there is no one who understands, there is no one who seeks God. What the author of Romans tells us in, um, in this is he's saying that everybody kind of enters into the door of a relationship with God, not because they want God, but because you want something. When I first found Jesus, it wasn't that I wanted Jesus, I wanted Jesus to do something. Now, hear me loud and clear, I actually think that this is okay for you, this is how we all start, but it can't stay there. It can't stay that the nature of your relationship with Jesus are all of the things that he can do for you, but rather him and who he is by himself. You know, when I first found Jesus, what I wanted to do was not go to hell, and I wanted God to make my life right and make my life better. I think God loves us, and God doesn't want you to go to hell, and God does want to make your life, God does want to be a part of your life and give you the things that would make you thrive in in life. But that can't be the sole source of why we pursue God. So one of the things I think about in terms of what robs Jordan's desire for God is I, I think I just want other stuff more. It's not bad, the stuff that I want. I just want it more. For me, I, I was talking to a friend about, um, a, about uh, a pastor friend that we know that's retiring. And one of the crazy concepts I think about all the time is I really want to end really, really well. And I hope and pray that that is in decades from now. The Lord gives me health and strength to do a really good job. But I was wondering, what if the Lord wanted me to give up Renaissance this week? And if everybody said, oh, yeah, that's the best idea to do it. Is God enough by himself? Or is it Jesus and success? Is God enough by himself for me? If I'm being honest, it's, it's a wrestle. I don't know that I'd be able to do that right now. I'd have to wrestle. Now, I think what the Lord has been doing in my life and what I think the Lord wants to invite you in your life is for us to first examine what are the things we are in search of? Why are we in search of them? And what happens if the Lord doesn't give us those things? We're going to talk about this in a future series But one of the things I've talked to people about is, you know, when you're a pastor, people just talk to you about God all the time. I'll be at Harlem Tavern, um, and people will just start telling me their whole faith story. And um, I'm grateful for that opportunity. But one of the things I've heard over and over again is, I used to be a Christian. I used to go to church. Somebody got sick. We prayed for them to get healed. They didn't. That's when I realized this God stuff wasn't all cracked up to be, and I walked away. And I'm always gentle with conversations I have with people. Um, I know what it feels like to pray for someone who doesn't get healed. It's, it's devastating. But they were never coming to God for God. They were coming for God to do something. And when God was not useful to them, they discarded him. Is that the story of your life that you want it to be for you? That you come to God, and if God doesn't give you the thing that you're demanding of him, you leave him. Is that a relationship that is life-giving? The more and more we think about Um, the seasons of our life and what is we're in pursuit of, I think the Lord today wants you to examine and and to think about and to consider what is it that you're actually in pursuit of. That's a clarifying question. Sometimes it's not that you want other things more. Sometimes you're just so busy, you don't even notice. Like, you didn't do this on purpose. You just have all of the, the, you have your table set. And before you know it, in setting all of the positions for your table and filling up your plate in life, God, there's there's just no room for for God. Psalm 10 says that in his pride, the wicked man leaves no room for God. So we've figured out how to do life on our own, and we're just so busy that God is not even around, or we don't even have a a chance to pay attention to God. Other times, um, we just need to be encouraged. I think it's very normal to normalize that you could go through entire seasons where you have done all the right things, and for whatever reason, you are going through a spiritual season of dryness. That is normal. I've gone through that plenty of times in my life. But other, to- <clears throat> other times, it's because we're, we're distracted. 
Um, we've taken our eyes off the prize. We have failed to keep the main thing the main thing. You know, one of the things I think about in terms of the enemy, and I believe in the devil, not with the, you know, the, the red horns and the pitchfork, but the enemy that would whisper to you and try to distract us and take our eyes off of, of God. If you were to think about the most effective thing the enemy could do, it's not to make you do something wild and crazy. It's just to make you take your eyes off of Jesus. And he knows that you'll eventually just start to drift away slowly but surely. To drift, all you have to do is absolutely nothing. Others, other times, uh, we don't really desire God. And this has nothing to do with us. It's just because life is just really heavy. Now, if you are in a season of life right now where the cloud of grief and suffering hovers above you, you're not going to feel desire for anything. Like, that's the nature of grief. Grief robs desire, period. So I don't want you to walk away with any guilt or shame that you don't desire God above all things. When, like, this, the clouds of suffering are over your head, it's impossible. It's really, really difficult to desire anything. And for, for you, what I want you to do is just to keep on putting one foot in front of the other, trusting in God, and knowing that when you come out on the other side, and you will come out on the other side, you'll see this, the, the sun emerge again. And so we, we really want to focus today on nurturing and developing desire, cultivating desire in our life, because desire is the fuel for your life. Here's what Blaise Pascal says, everyone seeks happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means we employ, we all search for the same thing. Our wills never take a step except to pursue what we desire. This is the motive of every action of everyone. And so it's truly a, a, a powerful concept for us to be evaluating and nurturing our desire. Let me stop real, real quick, though. Most people at this point of the message are feeling a lot of guilt, like, Lord, I don't desire you. Something is wrong with me. Um, and I never want you to, to give in to the enemy's accusation of you. There's nothing wrong with you. That's shame. And shame will never grow anything good in your life other than guilt or pride. And so how do we cultivate godly, gospel-centered desire in our life? First and foremost, I think we just have to ask God. You know, we need God to want God. You need a healthy dose of the Holy Spirit active in your life to even have a desire for God. Here's what it says in Philippians 2 and 13. Um, it's a scripture that I want you to commit to memory. Philippians 2 and 13 says this, For it is God who is working in you both to will, to desire, to want, and to work according to his good purpose. What is Paul saying in Philippians 2? He says that it is the evidence of the Holy Spirit alive inside of you to even want him. And so we could never take credit. There is no amount of moral effort that you and I can summon uh, to cultivate our desires. First and foremost, when we sense a lack of desire and apathy in our lives, we need to ask God. And guess what? God is a good father who's committed to giving us good things. And God wants to give us good things in his life. You know, last night, my son spent the night at my brother's house. And, uh, you know, he's happy to be at my brother's house. We give him like five Skittles. When he goes over there, he gets the, the giant bag from CVS of Skittles. And I don't know if he was high off of Skittles or what, but he was on his iPad and he texted me, hey, dad, I love you. Right. <laughs> the cynical piece of me said he's about to ask for video games. He's about to ask for video games. <laughs> but he never did. And that kind of like that messed me up the whole night. <laughs> the heart of the father wants love. He loves you. He loves you. God desires a love-filled relationship with you where there's desire for, for him. Where you're not saying, hey, dad, I love you. By the way, can I get this? <laughs> because God is good, even if you were to say that, God will answer those prayers. But God is trying to show us the extent to which his love for us will hopefully motivate a love and a desire for him. You know, scripture says we love because he first loved us. And as we ponder the gospel and we ask God for grace to love him, to trust him more, God will answer our prayers. Number two, I think we, we grow in our desire. We cultivate desires by intentionality, by being really intentional. Now, I know this sounds kind of backwards um, 
Because I'm saying, well, only God can give you desire. And, you, and now I'm saying, but you have to be intentional. I think what God does is God provides the flame. And God is asking us to fan it. If you've ever done a, a, a fire by the fireside or a fire pit, you know, I'm not an outdoorsman. I'm from New York. I'm not an outdoorsman. I don't know how to do none of this stuff. Give me some light. I need a matches. I need matches to light something. I could never produce the fire. You could never produce the fire for God. But we can fan it. We can make sure other things are not crowding around it that would suffocate the fire that is already going. And so we ask God for the flame. And then when God gives us the flame, we are intentional about how we handle it. And so if you want to change how you are feeling about God and your desire, change what you're doing. If you want to change how you are feeling, change, how you are, change what you are doing. Tim Keller in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, it unearthed this amazing principle saying that actions of love in all of your relationships will always lead to feelings of love. Try this out with your boss who you can't stand, your coworker who gets on your nerves, your roommate, uh, your spouse. If they get on your nerves, don't look at them right now. Um, <laughs> some, a friend, someone who's just like, where you're feeling distance from them. Ask yourself this one question, and I hope this question haunts you. Ask yourself this. What is the most loving thing I can do for them right now? And then do it. And then if you do that, watch your feelings for them change. It's our actions of love that will lead to feelings of love. And so many times we go through life waiting for us to have a feeling of love for God while our actions, for, our actions remain disinterested. If you want to fan the flame of God's love, God, desire for God, be intentional. Now, the opposite is also true. Actions of disinterest lead to feelings of disinterest. Actions of disregard lead to feelings of disregard. Actions of hatred lead to feelings of hatred. You know, one of the things that you'll see most profound about the American slave trade is that it did not start... What we know about the American slave trade and its brutality, it didn't start like that from day one. What happened was, over the years and decades and centuries of treating people as subhuman, their feelings for them started to grow into that these people are truly subhuman. It was their actions of hatred that made them feel hatred. And so, if you and I want to develop strong passion in our relationship with God, we need to make sure that we are directing our feelings in such a way that we are intentional. And we're not just intentional, we're consistent. So the third one is to be consistent. You and I need a whole lot of consistency because our hearts are prone to forget. We are prone to wander. We are so quickly, we set out with great intention and then we, and we go away. One of my favorite Psalms talks about just like this nature and this interplay between consistency and, and intentionality. The book of Psalms were prayers that were meant to be sung in the gatherings of God's people. And they would regularly come together consistently, no matter how they felt, sing songs, sing songs like this. Come, let's shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let's enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let's shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand, and the mountain peaks are his. The sea is his, and he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let's worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. Now, the Psalms are a book for us to read repeatedly. Why is that? Because God knows we consistently need to be pointed back to the practices that will develop a nurture and a desire for him. God's people have been singing these songs for thousands and thousands of years, irrespective of how they felt that morning when they woke up. But by the time they left, their hearts, I'm sure, would be made more alive. So here's the thing. You and I need to create intentional, consistent spaces where spontaneous things can happen. You and I need to create intentional, um, consistent spaces where spontaneous things can happen. A lot of times people tell me, like, yeah, I was praying and nothing happened. I'm like, well, how long are you praying? Like, two days. And like, well, buddy, we got to pick this up. We got to add, lengthen that a little bit. If you want to experience depth in your relationship with God, we need to strive for, for consistency. 
Now, one of the things that's really fascinating about this is we cannot rely on the dopamine hit to make you consistent. We can't rely on excitement to make you consistent. We actually need to rely on other people around us. We need to borrow the faith from other people. We need to be deeply embedded in community to help us remain consistent. You know, one of the marks of a really immature relationship is that it relies on excitement to keep it going forward. When my wife and I first started dating, um, her first trip to New York, I had that whole calendar. That, that day was packed out. We went to go see the Yankees. This is before when they made the playoffs and they were good. Um, we went to one of my favorite restaurants downtown. Uh, you know, we walked the High Line and saw celebrities. And now, I'm not doing all three of those things. That's a month. <laughs> we went to the Yankees. Nah, I ain't, yeah, that's, that's a month. Why is that? Because the depth of our relationship has increased. So I no longer need to rely on these amazing, spontaneous, incredible dopamine hits to get things going. It's already going. If it ain't going now, it's not going nowhere. <laughs> God doesn't want you relying on dopamine hits for your consistency. He doesn't want you relying on a service that was like, yo, I felt like rolling down the aisle when they sang that song. <laughs> That's not going to carry you. You and I need to be surrounded by a group of people that will help you be consistent when things are boring, when things are regular, when things are mundane. And when you do that, there will be spontaneous moments that blow your mind, but you and I have to be in regular rhythms of prayer, of gathering together, of reading scripture. All right, uh, number four, this is a, it's a big one and a, and, a, and a heavy one. In order to cultivate desire in our life, we need to repent of any sin that we are harboring in our lives. For those of you who um, are in a dating relationship or something, I want you to think about what's the one thing that my significant other hates? And imagine walking to the house with that in your hand and saying, like, yo, I'm here to go out. Like, how is that, how is that day going to go? Simply because you won't let go of the thing that you know they don't want you to hold on to, it's going to mar and hurt your relationship. And so one of the things that's most misunderstood about um, the word holiness, for example, I grew up in a faith tradition where every time I heard the word holiness, I thought it just meant better than. Like, so if somebody was holy, they're a holy roller. That means they're better than everybody else. Holiness has nothing to do with better or worse. Holiness means that this thing is set apart for a specific purpose. So a bowl could be holy, not because it was painted better, but rather that this bowl is used for the one express purpose of ceremonial washing. It's used for nothing else. And by the, the simple nature of the fact that this ordinary, regular bowl that looks like the rest of the bowls is separated for one singular purpose, now it's holy. What God is calling you to be, what God is calling me to be is holy. It's set apart for him and for his use. And we can't do that when we're ho holding on to and we're harboring sins in our life. 1 Peter 2 and 11 says this, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires Here's what he says, that wage war against your soul. So holiness is about our allegiance to God and being singularly, singularly literally used for, for him. Number five, if we're going to cultivate desire, we need to believe what God says about you. You need to believe what God says about you. So long as you are relying on the words that you tell yourself about yourself, so long as we are listening to the lies of the enemy of what he says about you, will never cultivate a deep passion for God, which is why we need regular exposure to God's word to reframe our thinking about ourselves. I want to read three scriptures to you that I hope you'll take to heart. Number one, you belong to God. Ephesians 1 and 5 says this, He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. When God thought about you, God had a purpose and God predestined us to be adopted into his family. You and I belong to him. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself and how inconsistent you are or whatever you've done in the past. You can't call yourself junk because you belong to him. Number two, we are secure. John 10, 28 through 29, Jesus says these words, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. No one is able to snatch you out of God's hand. You are secure in him. 
And in order for us to truly have a, a, a regular rhythm of desire for God is that we are seeing how secure we are in him. Number three, we're valuable. Oh, my God, you're so valuable to him. Jesus says these words in Matthew 6. He says, consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they are? And so those are just three scriptures. I could have read 42 of them. But we need to be in regular rhythms being exposed to God's word so we can believe what he says about us. And we can believe who he is in our lives. Lastly, we need to participate in corporate worship. I want to be sensitive on this. I know in the days of online, I'm so grateful for our online family and everybody who rocks with us and how YouTube has opened up a whole way for us to stay connected even in times where physical connection is not possible. But I want to gently encourage you all to make corporate worship something that is a priority. In Hebrews 10, it says, let us draw near with a full, with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled, clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. When we gather together for corporate worship, it is designed to remind you that in the center of all things is a glorious and gracious king, and that king is not us. When we come together for corporate worship, it is designed to fill you with awe as you hear again about the glory of God and the gift of his amazing grace. As we gather together for corporate worship, it is designed to lure us away from our little kingdom of one and enthrall you again into the kingdom of God's glory and his grace. Corporate worship is meant to kickstart your desire. So in just a moment, we're going to do two things. We're going to rise, if you would, please rise for a corporate prayer. For those who can rise, please rise. And then immediately following our corporate prayer, we're going to have a time to center our hearts on God through song. Please read with me the bolded parts of what you see on the screen. God, you are holy and worthy of all our lives. Yet, we have failed to love you with our hearts and minds and soul and strength. And still, you have called us to come to you. We feel unworthy, for we have failed you again and again. We feel like running away, yet you keep calling us. Have mercy on us, O God. Have mercy. O God, trustworthy God, we do not always trust you. We are afraid that if we follow your ways, we will miss something. Yet you are holy and wholly trustworthy. This is you who brought us from our mother's womb. Our God, our God, grant us faith, faith to trust you, faith to follow your ways. Grant us passion in our devotion to you. To you be honor and glory. Amen.